On this episode, Scott and I welcome Steve Oren, Federal CTO at Intel Corp, to the show to discuss SCRM and supply chain up and down the stack. Stay tuned for this edition of Eclipsium's Below the Surface. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Welcome to Below the Surface, the firmware and supply chain security podcast. This is episode number 10 for May 17th, 2023. I'm Paul Zadorian. I am joined by Mr. Scott Shefferman. Scott, welcome. Thanks for having me on. As always, this is going to be a fantastic episode. I can't believe we have this guest uh, in our presence. So much good stuff to talk about. Yeah, we've been having some great conversations. I'm excited for today as well. You got a new background too. I like the new background, Scott. looks good. Thanks. Very, very yeah. rustic. I'm doing so, a remodel, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Our guest today is Steve Oren. Steve is Intel's federal CTO and senior principal engineer. He leads public sector solution architecture strategy and technology enhancements and has held technology leadership positions at Intel, where he has led cybersecurity programs, products, and strategy. Steve was previously the CISO for Sarveg, Sarvega. Sorry, CTO of Sanctum, CTO co-founder of Lockstar, and CTO of Syndata Technologies. Steve is a recognized expert and frequent lecturer on enterprise security. He was named one of InfoWorld's top 25 CTOs among several other awards. Steve, it's nice to have you here on the show today. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm lo- looking forward to a really good conversation. Steve, how did you uh, get your start in information security? Well, actually goes back a long time ago. Um, As a kid, I was a hacker and uh, played around with technology, with computers, breaking software, having fun in the 80s, and then uh, was going to go the research biology route because that was the career path you could do back in the early 90s, late 80s, uh, because computer science really hadn't taken off yet as a career path. And then around 95, I sort of had a year off between things and had an opportunity to do a startup where a guy had some money, wanted to do something interesting. And he said, well, you're a hacker. You should know this stuff. Can you come help me out for a while? And I jumped into it, figuring I'd you know have some fun for a little bit and just fell in love with the industry, fell in love with technology and really looking to try to secure systems uh, from a vantage point of understanding how things fall apart and how things break. And so that was my first startup back in 95. And I really never looked back having done multiple startups in the security space throughout the 90s and 2000s, and ultimately getting acquired by Intel in 2005, and for about nine years ran security pathfinding, or the advanced security research around software and, and the how the software plays with hardware and developing new security capabilities around it. So it's been a fun ride, and before I took on the federal about nine years ago, uh, and now my charter is obviously much larger, but several cybersecurity is at the heart of what you know a lot of the federal conversations and activities uh, range around. Yeah, so you probably worked with or uh, at least know our probably our founders, uh, senior VP of strategy, John Lucades, because they they all came from Intel. I'm not sure if you overlap there, but you probably it sounds oh, like absolutely. I work roles. closely with Yuri okay. with. Uh, with John and with a lot of the team that's over Eclipsium. And I used to, you know, joke that Yuri was my ace in the hole. If ever there was a deep tech and security problem that, you know, on the, at the firmware or lower levels, Yuri was the first person I called. Yeah. Yeah. Still, still, still true today. Yeah. <laughs> still true today. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Yuri's inputs are of course, extremely valuable uh, to the team as we, as we can, you know, talk about these complex topics as we were talking about before the show. Uh, these topics can be very, very complex, and there's been a lot of recent events that have kind of put a spotlight on some of this complexity. And it's interesting to to watch people go, "Oh, but isn't isn't this true?" Like, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's not true. Uh, I guess let's first start with with Secure Boot, right? So we had um, Baton Drop, which is the uh, vulnerability, and the Black Lotus um, Boot Kit that takes advantage of this vulnerability. Steve, what's your assessment on uh, on Secure Boot and in some of the recent threats against it? So you bring up a good question and it goes to right to the, the heart of what you said about the complexity. Secure Boot means different things to different people. Are you mm-hmm. talking about a particular feature of let's say the firmware in the case of UEFI Secure Boot? 
Are you thinking about secure boot of a platform based on a capability, whether that be something like you know boot guard or TXT measured boot? Are you looking at sort of sealing, which is a secure but authenticated boot? It means different things depending on what features you're doing, what the outcome you're looking for. Um, so the, at the heart of that question is what does secure boot mean? And a lot of people sort of take for granted that if I flip a switch, I get UFI secure boot, I've got secure boot. Well, that's not really true. You've got a secure boot of a component of the process of booting a system. When you look at the macro sort of from you know power on all the way through to you know login screen, there may be multiple secure boot processes that happen along the way that will be dependent on the platform, whether you're on a client system or a server system or in the cloud or on-prem, whether you've enabled certain features in BIOS, whether you have a UEFI or a custom BIOS or a core boot, and what operating system or hypervisor you're running will all have a factor in what entails the overall measured, secure, or validated boot of a system. So when you pick on that, you know, like that Black Lotus example, it was a vulnerability they're taking advantage of in the UEFI secure boot. So it's one aspect of secure boot that they found uh, a mechanism to bypass or work around. It doesn't mean you can't have secure boot. It doesn't mean that all secure boot is compromised. It just focuses on that one aspect, on that one flavor, if you will, yeah. of secure boot and as an issue. It's interesting, Steve, as you describe uh, the various components of secure boot, uh, I, my mind immediately goes to the supply chain because as you're like rallying them all, I'm like, yep, the OEM, it plays a role. The chip manufacturers play a role. The developer of the U EFI firmware and software or software, right, plays a role. Um, the operating system vendor plays a role. You know, all the way up to the the modules uh, that are loaded inside of the kernel uh, into secure boot. So there's, we like to say, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, and then when something goes wrong, we all tend to point fingers at each other or be. I, I don't want to say whether there's like a blame game going on, but there's a, I think, confusion of who's. Whose responsibility is it? In, in, included in that is the end uh, user and owner of the system. What roles do we play in this complex supply chain? And it's a very good point. Uh, and I also would joke that you know you have a lot of chefs in the kitchen along with our sous chefs. Mm -hmm. So you know BIOS, you know, is it, who wrote all the BIOS? There are actually multiple people involved, multiple organizations involved in the BIOS, including open source. Uh, even from a hardware manufacturing, you know, the chip plays a key role. The chip sets play a key role. But so does the TPM, which may come yeah. from another provider altogether. And so there are a lot of chefs and maybe sous chefs in the kitchen when it comes to doing secure boot. And also, as you get downstream to the user or to the admin and the IT department that supports that user, what features did they enable? What did they turn on? Did they flip the switch in the BIOS to turn on hardware secure boot or software secure boot? Did they in provision keys to the TPM? Those kind of questions are also part of the overall supply chain and the supply chain story when you're looking at the security of a given system when you're running it or when you're logging into it. Yeah. So, Go ahead, Scott. Uh, yeah. Just, before we move off of Black Lotus, I'm just curious, like, if, if you had to explain to our audience that since Black Lotus and the baton drop vulnerability in the UFI security boot process has kind of manifested for the first time in the wild, um, from an impact perspective, how 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 and where does that break things, and how how should organizations look at that as as a problem that needs to be solved um, for the end user specifically for our listeners? So I think like like most other vulnerabilities and exploits that we find, uh, the key is obviously to do you know uh, patch and remediate, um, and there's two aspects to it with something like. Uh, the Black Lotus UFI secure boot, and it all reminds us, uh, you know, of, of some of the earlier BIOS malware, like Mabroni back in the day. Turn on the hardware security boot features so that you can get a uh, hardware root of trust as part of that uh, that trust chain, and that's one thing that's an easy recommendation. Just about every platform on the planet comes with this capability if you enable it. Um, the other is make sure that you are, in fact, patching and updating your BIOS. And a lot of organizations get, you know, sort of squirrely when it says, oh, I don't want to touch the BIOS. That's a scary thing to do. It's very clear we need to be uh, treating BIOS like we do our operating system and applications. We patch those because we know security vulnerabilities need, need to be patched and mitigated. The BIOS and the firmware needs to be patched and mitigated as well. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that BIOS is software and needs to be treated with the same level of diligence that you would with like your operating system. You know, the, I don't know if we're going to get to a patch Tuesday for firmware, but we need to think of it in that kind of perspective. Um, 
a lot of organizations leverage UEFI Secure Boot as their Secure Boot mechanism. They sort of take, pick the easy button, if you will. It comes with the, the, the BIOS. It's an easy to configure and enable. It doesn't require them to understand their hardware, which, again, is more perception than reality of the difficulty or complexity because it's really that easy to flip a switch in the BIOS to turn on things like Measure Boot and Secure Boot. But a lot of times they go with the easy button. And so when something like Black Lotus comes out, it compromises one of their you know foundational controls that they've been relying upon. And so it's imperative that they patch and, and mitigate that uh, as soon as possible. But then also look at there are existing mechanisms that have been out for a long time that give you a deeper level of security beyond the, uh, the just UEFI secure boot. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Steve, uh, you mentioned measured boot. What What is measured boot for our audience? Sure, it's a good uh, distinction, and there's multiple ways to describe this. I, I like to think of measure boot as being able to measure every step of the process from power on all the way through OS or hypervisor and even guest launch, and have a, a me measurement is basically a, a special kind of hash. In uh, in trusted computing parlance, a measurement or a PCR, what it does, what it is, is a hash of that thing as a function of both itself and the thing that came before. So if you think, you know, firmware booting to an OS, OS booting to a guest, or if it's even a, a low level uh, firmware booting to the next level of firmware, that chain of trust is created by hashing the thing you're looking at with the last hash from the thing before, creating a connection between the very early stage all the way through, and then maintaining that measure in a secure place like a TPM, where you can verify that you the known good. Did my system boot? correctly with all the things that are supposed to boot in the correct order with no changes or no substitutions along the way and be able to verify that in a cryptographic way and that's what measured boot really enables and features like intel txt um, and other features out there in the market allow you to get that measurement and the quoting or the attestation of that measurement so that you can verify before i you know allow uh applications to run or before i uh, release secrets to a platform i can know that it valid it was a valid boot it's different from a secure boot mm -hmm. or what's sometimes called an authenticated boot and what those and the difference being that a, a measure boot will run through the whole process collecting the measurements along the way and then present the data to a, a relying party whether it be a local attestation service or a remote one to verify the information secure boot is, a, is usually applied much earlier in the process or to a very specific part of the process and it will, if it doesn't validate, if the, 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 the it does not match, it will stop. It won't allow the continue boot or it will send you to a mediation mode, pop up an error screen. There are a variety of different actions that may happen, but it doesn't allow the continue boot. And it's typically things like, if you think a look at the Intel technology around boot guard, where it verifies that I, IBB or initial boot block as one of the key things that must be correct. And if it's not, you don't want to boot. Or in the case of UFI secure boot, where the idea is that, again, it's going to measure itself against a key. And if that key is invalid, if it's not you know, measured correctly, it's going to notify, hey, I did not securely boot. And that's the slight, you know, sort of the subtle difference. Now, there's relativeness within secure boot. A hardware enforced secure boot is a much is built on the fact that you have a key rooted in hardware that's doing that validation and authentication. A UFI secure boot is based on a firmware key. So again, your attestation only goes back as far as where that firmware key is stored. Um, on the platform, you know, sort of by the OEM or by your, your BIOS when it gets uh, initially provisioned. Um, but it's a different process as opposed to measurements, maintains those measurements in a secure area that you can then validate either at boot time or later, whereas, you know, secure boot is sort of at the time of boot, you can sort of say yay or nay, and it's usually done on a much smaller TCB or trust control base um, because you don't want to brick the system. Steve, are these are these features secure boot aside? Uh, the other features that you mentioned are these things that we have to turn on and worry about when we're deploying systems, or does it, it kind of come pre-installed uh, for us? So, for the most part, from from your OEMs, the the features are already let's call it, they're already enabled, they're already on the system. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. and I would say a vast majority of time. On a server platform, it's a when you're doing your initial provisioning of the system, you're loading the the, the, the operating system. Before you even get there, when you get to the, your first BIOS configuration, it's a switch in the BIOS. You know, it enable trusted boot, flip on, you know, provision the TPM. There's usually two or three switches depending on the OEM of provisioning the the TPM and then enabling uh, measured or trusted boot is what it will be called 
Uh, sometimes we'll say turn on TXT. It can be as explicit as that. Mm -hmm. um, in the more modern systems and modern servers, we've actually merged boot guard and TXT to give you just one flip of a switch as opposed to having two different features to enable. So it gives you both measure boot and the, the secure boot from the IBB in one feature. Um, and then when you're talking about UEFI secure boot, those are that's something you configure in the UEFI BIOS, BIOS separately from the hardware. But it's by most server systems, you've got to turn it on. Um, again, again, it's just sort of the way the OEMs go. On client systems, you're going to sort of see you know, two basic approaches. We've we've gotten to the point now, with, especially with Microsoft and Core PC, that secure boot is a requirement. It, you know, in order to be able to do secure PC, you must have it, and it will auto configure on a system that's capable of doing. And now, it, TPMs are required for mm -hmm. you know Windows 11 and Windows 10 secure uh, Core PC requirements. So a lot of that is getting automated for the client systems in order to take advantage of those more advanced features. If you're running a Linux operating system, you still got to go in and flip the switches to turn it on in the BIOS. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where the third-party CA support in some systems has to be enabled, correct? Yeah. The, the Linux folks weren't shy about uh, their displeasure with that. <laughs> as, you know, I mean, that's par for the course. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, you mentioned boot. So the way I separate is the boot guard from secure boot is I look at boot guard as earlier in the boot stage and more tightly coupled to hardware than secure boot. But you had a much better, I think, explanation and analogy of, of the differences between boot guard and, and secure boot. UE5 secure boot, I should say. Yeah, so the way you think about boot guard, it's the initialization. It's the very first step before the you know, UEFI sort of takes over. And all of these processes, when we talk about the boot, a lot of the way it works is it's what I call a handoff. Something does its job and then hands off control to the next thing to then hand off the control to the next thing. And that's sort of the flow at the lowest level of how all these different systems are each having their, I want to use the word firmware. I don't want to confuse people, BIOS and firmware, it's, they sometimes get interchangeable. But there's, let's just say there's different parts of the firmware that are actually running at different stages of that boot. And each phase does a handoff to the next one after it's completed its job. And what measured boot does is verify that your, you know, each phase before you do the handoff has been measured and that the next phase is known good or at least can be measured before the, you trust that it's going to do its job. In the case of boot guard, because of the, the initialization is like the very first stage of the handoff to somebody else's code, in the case of UEFI, we want to measure that block, make sure that it is sacrosanct before handing off control to UEFI. That's why boot guard is such a crucial component to turn on for this uh, early stage is it's the last handoff, if you will, from the Intel technologies mm -hmm. to the BIOS that's written by somebody else, you know, the UEFI or core boot that's going to take over and do a whole bunch of things on its own. Then in within UEFI secure boot, they'll have their own manifest to securely measure and, and uh, uh, test each of their spots because it's not one big monolithic. There's a bunch of things that hand off there as well. And they'll have a manifest that's sort of that's tied to that UEFI secure boot. But I guess the best way to think about it is that Boot Guard addresses the very first in the UFI side, or the very last in the Intel side, handoff to the, the, the BIOS runtime to start doing its job. And you want to make sure that that initialization, you know, the IBB, the boot, that boot vector is secure because that is the most important launch point from there onto what could be the legitimate BIOS versus something illegitimate. And to bring it back to <coughs> supply chain as well, the uh, Intel creates this these frameworks and structures and technology um it, that goes to the oem and when we talk about boot guard it's the oem's responsibility to pre-configure that correctly before the hardware and, and firmware or software right gets shipped to the end consumer right so the oem plays a very critical role in the supply chain in supply chain security in this case absolutely and that ultimately <clears throat> and again bios is you know looks like one big monolithic there's Depending on on the operating uh, the the OEM, there could be a, a of the early firmware. A lot of that is Intel firmware, and then the OEM may be you know thirty to twenty percent additional firmware. Um, when you look at sort of the what's the control space and the, and the amount of code, the key thing to recognize here is that the you know there's an Intel key for the boot guard that's sort of the Intel rooted key that verifies that boot block, and then there's an OEM key that's sort of the where they put in their key for launching their BIOS component moving beyond that. And then there will be like UEFI will have a key bound to that OEM key or bound to a public key that they'll use to be able to launch UEFI or core boot or any of the other, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Phoenix or you know, MSI or any of the other BIOSes. So there's actually multiple keys in involved in that supply chain. 
the Intel key, which is rooted in hardware, the OEM key, which may be fused into the system or, or loaded into a non-volatile um, uh, set of memory to be able to store the key for the OEM. And then there's the key that you know ultimately gets provisioned by the BIOS when you launch like a UFI, you know, when you load the UFI, which oftentimes is loaded by the OEM, but captured from that open source repository. So it's come. Paul, if I may ask uh, uh, an interesting question here. So I'm hearing the word keys. I'm hearing root of trust. I'm hearing bound to hardware originally. Um, all this loosely wants to describe to, to a layman not understanding this layer of technology. It sounds to me like there's a crypto system at play that's complex. And in any crypto system, when you do crypto analysis, you often find that key management is the rub or where the we weakness is. How how does how does this go from let's say an Intel in general to to an OEM? How do you do key management in this regard? Is it something that is established and done? I guess for lack of better words, correctly in the context of a crypto system, or is it more adaptable, flexible to achieve individual portions of those hand handoffs as I guess separate crypto systems? So it's exactly the last point that I was going to say. It's not a crypto, crypto system. It's crypto systems mm. um, that are loosely tied together based on, again, because you've got, you have to realize with the exception of certain platforms that are sort of pre-configured all the way through, sort of the full application, I think like an iPhone. An iPhone is right. basically you get out the box. It's all one vendor that sort of controls everything. Most of our supply chain for servers and clients, you have multiple players along the way. You have Intel providing the chips to a motherboard provider that then provides that to an OEM, that then the OEM could be getting either their own BIOS or a third party BIOS. There may be a supplier that adds some other secret sauce on there. So there's a complex supply chain and each one is gonna have a play in providing capabilities along that way. So it's a series of crypto systems that can be linked together. And this is the, why the benefit of both having things like secure boot for those individual crypto systems and harder root of trust and the idea of a measured boot, which can go across those, let's call it across those systems and provide measurements of all the players, even from downstream operating system or hypervisor vendors. And that's one of the reasons why measure boot is so important not to forget that even though it doesn't provide that secure boot, as far as the time of boot, it provides a cross system measurement for each one of those players that could be coming from different parts of the supply chain. So they, they serve as different roles, but going to your, your original question, it's a series of crypto systems, but because we're using public key technology, you know, one can sign or, 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 or uh, uh, verify the, you know, the signature of the prior one because it's a public key. They can encrypt their data in such a way that it can be verified by the next downstream using digital signatures and using this sort of this, this PCR chain or hashes of things against public keys. So they may be separate crypto systems in the sense that UFI secure isn't bound to the Intel hardware rooted key, whereas things like boot guard and other, and other secure boot mechanism, microcode verification and other things are bound to a hardware root key. There's, they're, they're individual systems, but when you link them together in the macro, you can verify the individual components and then you can do something like a measure boot to verify that everything did occur correctly. But no, so, so, so go ahead, Scott. Well, go ahead, Paul. Sorry. I was just going to say, but the, the system is only as secure as long as folks protect their respective private keys because we're all kind of on the same playing field here like every, everyone's got their own private keys it just takes one to leak and uh, the whole root of trust or at least a portion of that root of trust can be compromised correct so there, there's some dependency on on uh common keys across architecture especially when you start talking up the stack kind of stuff like bios keys that are going to be oem specific um when you talk about sort of the root key on each on each platform it's a unique key per platform that's providing uh, so that that binding, if you will, to that specific platform, and that's squirt, if you will, squirt it in at part of the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. There's also there are the Intel public key that's used to verify the firmware and be able to say, you know, we are able to verify, and that key is in, you know embedded in in silicon, and it allows us to verify that the BIOS or the you know software downstream that somebody else has written, we can verify that code and verify our own code. The complexity of these ecosystems, if you will, is, is where some of the com the confusion of sort of what is a, a key, whose key is it, and when key yeah. was involved. You know, when you think about, you know, when, when things, you know, people look at cryptanalytic uh, attacks 
or if there's data breaches and things like that. It's a complex ecosystem. And I think the challenge is, is that because there's multiple players in the supply chain, it becomes hard to say, well, it does that affect my security? I think this is what goes back to the idea of defense in depth, making sure that you turn on all those security features and you are verifying. And that's another problem we have with a lot of the secure boot is even when people turn it on, no one actually looks to see if anything was securely done. They say, oh, I flipped the feature on, I must be good. And they don't actually verify that the boot happened securely. They're not attesting that the, the state is still good. And they're not uh, verifying that those systems are continuing to operate in a secure manner. And I, I joke if a, if a server boots securely in the woods and no one's there to verify it, is it really secure? It's funny. Um, I know it's, it's a terrible dad joke. But, but it's, it's funny you say that, Steve. So I uh, presented recently in a conference and I had a slide up and it was application software. And one of the applications was like, hey, uh, I'm going to install the software, but the operating system was like, I don't recognize this key, but if there's a new key, do you accept this key? And I asked the audience, I'm like, be honest now. You're installing software on a Linux system. Like how many people are just saying yes and moving on with life? And you know, like 60, 70% of the people were on and they were like, yeah, like I'm going, I'm going right by. It goes back to your point, Steve. Like a lot of the security also relies on not just protecting the private keys, but the end user actually doing due diligence to validate that all the stuff is happening correctly. Correct. Absolutely. And, and, and building in the policies and controls to verify that. Mm -hmm. Scott. So, yeah, so your, your last comment about policies and controls. So, um, it, like when you look at the secured core uh, PC technology, a lot of people think that's actually just like a feature when in fact it's many dozens of features that all have to be working and configured by the OEM in almost a perfect state for secured core to do its job in a in a secure state, for lack of better words. Like it needs it, to actually deliver on the promise of secured core and what it's trying to mitigate against as a security technology it's a stack of configurations and features and i use that example just because you know there's so many dozens of those features and here at eclipse I, I think we have yet to ever take delivery of a modern very expensive secured core pc that was shipped to us configured in a secure fashion even though the feature potential is there the code is there so kind of moving backwards from secured core to what we've been discussing and again, looking at this as a crypto system, you know, you can attack crypto systems with math or key management uh, and secrets, but you can also attack it a lot of ways, uh, as you know, as a hacker, um, I guess, orthogonally in, in, in ways where you can, uh, like the BMC is on the same bus as the UEFI, and that becomes a vector to write to uh, to, to the UEFI if, if certain bits aren't set correctly from the OEM or not, they're not configured by the end user. I feel like that aspect, that, I guess, configuration aspect and the complexity of the supply chain is where a lot of the rub actually comes in um, well beyond just key management and maths when it comes to this system of crypto systems. Yeah, is that, is that you highlight a key well? point there. Uh, I want to start with the, you know, none of these things are absolute, right? I mean, it's it, you're setting up a, a series of controls, a defense in depth approach where you're, you're applying security controls to, to enhance the overall security, to raise the bar, to reduce the risk, or mitigate some of the threats. Um, it's not a you know, zero sum game where like I flip the switch and I'm done. And and you know you've seen it with you know things like configuring for secure P. It requires good configuration and a lot of things to get just right. It doesn't mean you don't do it. I, I, I pick on I'll pick on a, a different one, not the BMC for example, but let's talk about SMM as an example, which was a glaring hole for a long time. And malware liars loved being able to hide their code and run things from SMM. And so that was a, a vulnerability that was out there that was, you know, certain, let's just say certain uh, providers in the supply chain liked that feature for being able to do things they needed to do from an OEM or from an, a downstream perspective. But being able to secure it in a way that allowed you to you leverage the feature when you needed it and then neuter it when you didn't was something that required new hardware. And so the idea is as we grow the, our capability and more users take advantage of it and we learn more about how to secure that in state, we're seeing features come along to actually continue to lock down the sort of the, those orthogonal approaches, whether it be BMC or SMM. And then also, I think one of the things about Core PC, it's also built on some technologies that have been vetted for a very long time. TXT has been out, God, since 2007 on clients, 2010 servers, boot guards since 2012. Um, we're seeing the, 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 the ecosystem get better at configuring and delivering it. It's still you know, work to be done, absolutely. 
But I, I, I think the key thing is, is that we're collectively we're learning and we're getting better at making it easier to deploy that at scale. And again, it takes a complex ecosystem of OEMs, board manufacturers, chip manufacturers, yeah. software vendors working in concert. And even then it takes time to get that completely right. But we're seeing advances. You know, if you think about it before Windows 10, you didn't have core PC. You had, you had to sort of do a lot of manual configuration to even get secure boot set up on a Windows client. And now we've come to full circle where we have it automatically doing a lot of those things for you, you when mean, configured correctly. Yeah, you mean, Steve, we can't just snap our fingers and have OEMs magically not ship boards in manufacturing mode? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no that's kind of, but that's got to be frustrating for you. And I think I had this similar conversation with with Vincent Zimmer. I mean, you mm. and the and everyone at Intel, right, is working to create these really awesome technologies. And then, like, you see circumstances where I mean, I ha I personally have boards that I manage in in servers that have manufacture, and I don't manage like server servers. They're more like studio podcast things. So they tend to use the more consumer based uh, like PC gaming hardware for our needs. And some of the boards are in manufacturing mode. <laughs> But I think that's gotten better. Is that yeah. is that what you're talking about in constantly working together and raising awareness to combat this problem? Exactly. And I think one of the things that, you know, it you mentioned it very early on, what is the responsibility of the user? And a, a lot of us in security don't want to rely or have to rely on the user being the, the security guru because that's a false premise. But it, where, where the user does play a very important role is in the demand signal. If users don't demand to have more security mm. or better or easier deployable security, then the suppliers and the OEMs and the operating system vendors aren't hearing the need and they're going to prioritize, you know, faster gaming and better Zoom calls. And so I think that it's, I'm not, I don't ever expect the users to be the security guru and I don't want them to have to learn how to configure early boot technologies. But they also have to demand better from their ecosystem and from their supply chain to get that security at the consumer level. We see the demand signals you know, on the enterprise, in regulated industries, financial mm -hmm. services, where they have a need, whether it be from regulatory or from value of the IP or little value of dollars that are at risk when these technologies aren't aren't deployed or aren't, aren't used. I think when you start looking at the, the broader consumer and small business, they have buying, they have buying power, they can create that demand signal that they want better security. And it's ultimately, that's really the one responsibility I think we need to have. Now we, as an industry should do better to enable them to have better security so they don't have to think about it, but let's face it, we're not there yet. And so there, that's one area where I think the, the average consumer can make a bigger, bigger noise about wanting better security for their systems. Scott. I got to ask a question here. So this is a, per I think this is a perfect segue that you just made, which is if you look at the executive order for OEM selling to the federal government, and their need here in June coming up to start a testing, and you realize that firmware is a part of that definition of critical software, and that now you have this, like you said, complex supply chain and all these OEMs that are now going to have to provide their SBOM and a test that they've done and shipped things securely and securely configured uh, by design, right? To, to use uh, Jen, Jen Easterly's term lately and a lot of what she's been writing about. Um, do you think that's how meaningful do you think that that attestation and those that the SBOM component of that will will be in terms of pragmatic improvement of security for federal systems? So uh, there's a lot of promise that has been uh, placed on this poor little document called an SBOM, a lot of high expectations. But I want to focus on one of the key areas, um, and this is something I've been working on um, with broad industry and government uh, collaboration, is that there is actually you know, one of the key value propositions of SBOM, and you take whether it be a Log4j or SolarWinds or any of those kind of attacks where there's a component or an attribute of, or a piece of software that has a known vulnerability and has an exploit out there. One of the first benefits you get from having that information, that transparency at the moment when you find out about this thing, is that you can immediately take action, whether that be additional mitigating controls, additional monitoring, segmentation, isolation, whatever the control set you plan to use, you can do that now. You don't have to wait for the OEM or the vendor to figure out that they have the problem, patch it, test it, and then deploy it, and then for your IT department to get it onto your system before you've got that closure of, 
of the of the of the exposure you can actually take action right away because you have the document that says here's the components and let's say you know in advanced world we have a vex but let's say we don't have that yet you have a cve come in and says log 4 jw2 is vulnerable well i've got three software packages that's claimed to have that piece of software whether they're vulnerable or not i can already do something about it i could start at monitoring that software isolating that network or putting in extra controls that's a value out of the gate. And that's where I think we'll start to see the initial value of SBOM is that early uh, transparency gives me the ability to act now. There's a lot of other benefits that SBOM is supposed to give us around better supply chain management, acquisition control, and a lot of other things that will come as we better operationalize it and as we get more of these in and start analyzing the data. But I think out of the gate, that's going to be one of the first values people will see when the first vulnerability gets identified in the SBOM that that I can start to mitigate right away. Yeah, I like <coughs> I like using S bombs and all their validation kind of uh, frameworks and processes before stuff gets shipped, before it's actually pre-installed is where I like to see it. But I also think I agree. See, there's a reactionary component uh, to S bombs that has to be there, and I guess it kind of goes back to when I mentioned manufacturing mode, which we didn't really explain. But when we talk and we set it up nicely because we talked about uh, Intel boot guard um, and manufacturing mode plays a role in that. And basically, if manufacturing mode is not closed, you can kind of throw all that security, uh, nice security that Intel provides out the window <laughs> because it's left in a configurable state. So a malicious actor could configure that for you and fuse fuse keys into the hardware. And again, that depends a lot on the architecture and, and all those other things. Um, but that that's one where we would like to know in the context of an, an SBOM or some kind of report, hey, this hardware manufacturing mode hasn't been closed. Like, don't ship it. Still go back to the OEM, have them fix this before it starts shipping. Yeah. So it's a good point. I think with something like manufacturing mode, I don't know if SBOM would be the mitigating control per se, but mm -hmm. I definitely think that there are good, uh, tools to be able to use to verify the registers and what, what mode. Um, and it may be something you can even do with something like Chipsec. Yep. Um, giving a little plug to Yuri's former project uh, around being able to, to, to verify. And this goes to the other part of the executive order. Everyone focuses on the SBOM, and the SBOM is an important artifact. But a lot of the executive order, and when you look at the guidance that's coming from CISA and ESF, it's also about changing the way the acquisition process works, doing supply chain risk management as part of the software, or in this case, hardware acquisition to verify what you're getting before you go deploy it at scale, before you put it into the sensitive environment. And it's more than just, did I get an SBOM or not? Did I get a self-attestation or not? It's actually doing the diligence. And part of that could be verifying, is the server configured the way I expect it to? And even from a supplier and then looking at the ecosystem, you know, the OEM may build a box, but a supplier is the one that actually then delivers it. They should be verifying before they deliver it because they're attesting to its state as well. And so it's it's really the, the at heart of the EO, while we all focus on SBOM, it's really about changing the way and putting more diligence into the supply chain and the acquisition process. And that goes, I think, to the heart of what you're talking about, about manufacturing mode and other problems that we'll find is verifying what you get when you get it before you deploy it. In some cases, in the case of SBOM, and there's guidance already out there on this, as you're doing your initial due diligence to pick the software, which software am I going to pick? Supply chain risk management should be part of that conversation, whether they have an SBOM or not, how many components are in their product, where was the product built? So you ask those hard questions and get data to make a better decision because today most products are bought whether what's cheapest and what mm -hmm. has the minimum set of features I need to deploy. And maybe, you know, is their support terms good? And that's the level of due diligence they do. And none of the security or supply chain risk management are ap applied. And that, if you look at the executive order, 1402208, it specifically says that supply chain risk management needs to be part of the acquisition process. And that fundamental change is what's going to help with these kind of issues beyond what an SBOM, which is just going to list the components and some other metadata. It wouldn't necessarily tell you that the OEM didn't configure the, the, the board correctly, but it does tell you that you should be doing better at uh, verification of what's coming into your systems. Yeah, because we can, we can change things more easily and harden things like the operating system, like Windows or Linux. There's many scenarios where pre-operating system, pre-installed software or firmware, you really as an end user can't change that. I think there's really, I don't think there's anything I can do about that board in manufacturing mode other than go to the OEM and go, hey, can you release an update? 
that fixes that. Is that is that true, Steve? In in most cases, I think I it's going to be dependent on the on the OEM and mm. the ODM. So, some of them it may be a BIOS update. Some of them uh, it's a configuration option. It mm. may be something as stupid as flipping a, a you know like a fusing a jumper. Yeah. I mean, it really it's, it's really a bonehead move to send out a, a, a <laughs> yeah. board in manufacturing. But I'll I'll say that as a personal, not necessarily as a representative of any corporation. Mm. But that should you shouldn't be doing that. And so. Um, I think that it's incumbent on, on the OEMs to make sure that they're putting, you know, if they're going to put out boards and they're not going to close off debug or turn off manufacturing mode, that there, there may be, there must be a really good reason. Like maybe you want people to go and fuse their yes. own firmware, and that might be great for certain maker environments, or if you're doing custom board development. Um, a lot of the ODMs, especially in the complex, not let's not talk the server or client world, but let's talk, you know, the appliance world or you know what we call Internet of Things or industrial systems. There's actually multiple players in that supply chain, and even the consumer of buying who's buying that will go and do physical changes in order to make it work for their specific environment. They may be plugging in additional capabilities at the lower levels for their specific environment. And so there are probably good examples of when it makes sense to ship a board that's not fully, you know, baked mm -hmm. in that respect. But for things that are going mass market, you know, they, they should come closed, ready to rock and roll. Mm. No, agreed. Scott? Yeah, so, you know, the, the title is podcast and kind of part of the intention of, of these kind of interviews with folks like yourself is to get your take versus our take on the threat landscape germane to the IT supply chain, germane to everything we've been talking about at this lower level, everything basically underneath the operating system, right? So I, I'm curious, you know, you've been doing this a long time. You started out in this industry as a hacker. So you, you, you know, you have the propensity that, to switch the hat back around backwards like Rocky does and, and approach this almost, you know, with wearing your black hat. Where do you see the, the greatest vulnerabilities going forward it kind of against the more macro context of chip wars race to quantum it sanctions against russia um uh, you know the balkanization or i guess the rebalkanization of bringing chip manufacturing back back to the united states or, or to the west in general japan in that macro context like what's the greatest threat at this level like how, how do you frame where, where we are now and where we're, we're headed in the next year or two or four so I think it's it's a really hard question because you know the, you look at what are the threats and I think you know from a cyber perspective it's going to continue to be the low hanging fruit. I mean we can talk about really cool firmware attacks, but let's face it, you know phishing works, <laughs> ransomware gets results, and so I don't think that's going to go away. I do think as many of the avenues that they use for doing it start to get closed, they look to other places um, in order to be able to affect their 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 malware, or affect their 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 mission. Uh, to be able to get at the get at the users or get at data. Um, if I look at sort of where I see some of the key trends, I really, you know, from a cyber specifically from a cyber perspective, and we could talk about the other, which is the macro level. I think that uh, the the se like you talked about the seams between things is going to be a key place of vulnerability. And that's going to be in the in the handoffs around firmware, because one of the things one of the properties that makes firmware and low level attacks exciting is the persistence and the stealthiness. You're below the OS which means you're below antivirus and other security controls typically. And so you're out of sight and able to persist cross boot. And that's one of the properties that a lot of these guys, uh, uh, nation states and uh, cyber criminals are looking for. At the same time, it's a heck of a lot harder to create stable functional malware that operates at that low level. Um, you're not talking about a weekend exercise to you know, bring up a new ransomware uh, that's going to not brick the system if you screw around with the uh, with the firmware. So it's a higher bar as far as the quality of malware that needs to be developed in order to go after those systems. But I think as we look at sort of the, the, the nation state actors, especially in the dynamic we're looking at, firmware is definitely going to be uh, front and center as one of the new, you know, the new evolving areas. We'll see more black lotuses, if you will. Yeah. On the other side of the camp, we're seeing a, finally a renewed, a, a real interest from the defenders in this black box that has been firmware. I think that's one of the things, I, a trends I've seen is that more and more folks are asking that question, well, how do I secure my malware? How do I make sure that I'm patching this correctly? What is the vulnerability of my supply chain? So we're asking the right questions so that we can get that visibility below the operating system, below the stack that we have not had uh, as an industry. Um, I think if you look at the macro, I think one of the key challenges from a supply chain is going to be, it's going to, a lot of it's going to have to do with availability. We have a lot of focus has been on the state of the art chips, you know, Intel and, and the and the CPU or the GPU or these you know, important chips to the conversation, absolutely necessary to run Windows. 
not as much conversation has been had about the other chips. And there are lots of chips. You open up your laptop or a server, you'll see lots of chips in there. Several of them are from Intel or from companies you know. A lot of them are going to be microcontrollers that you've never heard of before. Yet they control the power voltage regulation on the platform. And it's a 10 cent chip that comes from maybe one or two locations. So the supply chain availability of the variety of chips that go into that system are going to be a key important area to look at as we look at supply chain fragility in these macro environments of, you know, sort of shifting uh, winds on the, on the supply chain availability, nation state actors working, you know, against each other. Because one of the things I think both COVID and, uh, and the current situation have highlighted is that the interconnectedness of our supply chain is beyond what anyone thought. When COVID shut things down, a lot of things were infected for non-obvious reasons. You know, it wasn't that the, the Intel chips weren't coming from China, because they weren't coming from China. We had access, but sometimes the motherboard or the substrate or things like that were being, weren't available. And those are the necessary components to build the chip, the, the, the foundations that goes into a server or a laptop. And so there's, it's a very complex ecosystem. And I think that availability is going to be a key threat or a key concern going forward of, can I get access to the materials and the, and the chips I need to build a server or to build a, a laptop? And then with, when you look at sort of nation state kind of approaches to those kind of attacks, we, we all, you know, the, the, the conversations are being had about what is the security of that supply chain? And could somebody in, inject something or interject and where's the weak links on that process? And a lot of it's the downstream. I mean, no one's, the reality is no one's gonna be attacking the fab. That's just not, it's too complex. And it's, you know, the, 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 the controls in place are beyond what any, even a nation state could really go after to make modifications. But what about that box that gets shipped from the, the factory that's on its way to Best Buy? What's stopping someone from doing an interjection there? That's a question that people are asking. How do I protect the platform throughout its total life cycle? And how do I verify all the hardware is what's supposed to be there and is working correctly? And there are standards that are being created to be able to do verification, not just of the chip like we talk about here in Secure Boot. But what about the network card? What about the PCI cards? What about the graphics card and all the other components that are part of the system? I'd like to be able to verify them as well. And things like SPDM is a, is a standard that's been created to help do that attestation. Yeah, yeah. Stephen, I, I think you hit on a great point too, because one of the things that I learned recently, um, having got the opportunity to dig into some of the recent TPM vulnerabilities, uh, actually I ended up knowing the person that did the disclosure process for those vulnerabilities, uh, Yvonne Arce. Uh, and I interviewed him on another podcast and he gave a like, what I think is a classic supply chain story. He was like, researcher on my team, finds this vulnerability. He's like, I tested on my, my Dell laptop. I don't want to pick on Dell, but it just happens to be part of the story, right? He's like, I tested on my Dell laptop and it came back vulnerable. So I went to the TPM vendor and I said, hey, uh, this is Yvonne talking, right? Like you've got uh, this vulnerability. And they're like, no, we don't. He's like, yeah, we do. And they're like, oh, well that ships end of life. He's like, but my laptop is still uh, it's under support from Dell. So I guess expect that Dell would go back to you and, and demand an update or ask for an update, I should say, maybe then demand, who knows. But now this supply chain story puts us in an interesting predicaments when we have to protect our own infrastructure. How do we do that given this scenario? So it's a really good question, Paul. And it's part of it is, sort of, and again, you have to dig down into the executive order to see, but one of the things that's uh, been highlighted is the need for these kind of, you know, cross industry government collaboration on the supply chain side, because it is a very complex supply chain. And if there's a vulnerability or a security concern, how do you make sure that everyone can talk to each other to get the, the, the remediation done? Mm -hmm. And how does the government do a better job of sharing what they're seeing and be able to enable the ecosystem to fix the problem so that the government can actually get better secure systems. It's going to take, it takes a lot of work. When we look at what it took to do something like NIST 800-193, uh, that the platform resiliency standard that uh, basically was getting at the heart of being able to recover to a known good state. And that was a requirement. NIST laid it out. It's become part of contracts that uh, requirement that platforms be resilient and be able to adhere to the 193 guidelines. It took all of the vendors across, you know, competitors, frenemies, partners working together to create a standard that would work for, you know, CPUs, for the BIOS, for firmware that runs on a, on a hard drive, firmware that runs on a GPU, to be able to all agree on a format and a standard and a mechanism for securely updating and being able to do secure rollback and all the features that come with 
a platform, a resilient platform. And it took a lot of effort and, a, and over a, a year of time to get there. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of the same kind of requirement when we look at the supply chain risk management. It's a complex ecosystem and it's going to require, you know, doing that, you know, that information sharing at a level that makes lawyers uncomfortable. And so that's where the mm -hmm. government's going to provide sort of that umbrella banner of, you know, they call it the, the, the zone of liability protection or whatever you want to call it. But it will allow for that open sharing of vulnerability and, and, and information so that we can secure the, this complex supply chain. Scott, sorry, I thought you had something there. You were, you were moving around, and then <laughs> I was moving around. I'm, I'm getting get excited. I love everything everything uh, you're saying. I mean, it's just um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear everything you, you just said about like the resilience aspect of the, the ability to restore a system, and then I think about the research that uh, I'm, I'm working on with a, a gentleman named Vlad here at Eclipsium. Uh, and, you know, we're looking at the ability to bring down a baseboard management controller segment in a way that a data center or hyperscale environment literally could not recover from because your BMC is your last line of defense. Uh, and you can put that into a state, whether you're breaking it or whether you're doing some special tricks that we're working on, where only the attacker has access and the data center does not. And these boxes are constantly resetting. And you have backups, you have spare hard drives, you have firmware vendor uh, SLAs, you have you know the OEM with firmware update capability, all those things might be perfectly in place and perfectly executed, even though they never are. And yet we can completely bring down a data center. And I'm just like, it's it's amazing when you when you just apply a little bit of black hat kind of thought leadership in this space, how much you can expose the underbelly of it. Um, yeah, that's what keeps I, me it, up uh, night, it so is, that's why I love it's what you're fascinating saying. and BMC is a I mean it's is Eclipse and Michelle is a rich area of focus um there are approaches both available today and coming about how to mitigate that with components that aren't part of the normal operating and so one of the challenges with BMC is it's like I said the last line but it's also the necessary thing to runs orchestrates a lot of the, the work on the platform and so there's approaches like using CPLD and others to be able to have a gold image that's not part of that uh, runtime that you can rely on. The problem is, is that it takes time for the ecosystem to build up the, both the need and desire to go beyond what sort of the easy button approach. And I think sometimes it takes a little bit of the BMC type of hacks to kick them in the pants, but also it takes having the software ecosystem make it easier to deploy it at scale. Yeah. <coughs> Steve, these are these are hard problems too. Is um, yep. I think it was Black Hat Asia released some research and there was a research paper that was published earlier this year about physical like using uh firmware based attacks to uh construct or uh, affect physical damage on the systems um using the power management bus and, and other I, some of what was bmc technologies yeah. um and that was really super scary uh for me but i think it underscores the point that this stuff has to ship in a much higher security level so that the answer is not let's all go replace our hardware now i'm sure that there's manufacturers and companies that be like oh that's great like go replace your your hardware no. and i like i i mean i get that i mean i get at some point we do need to replace our hardware i don't want to see people forcing you know having their hands forced because i have to do it sooner than i really should have to which just underscores the point we need to get this stuff right before it ships yeah, and I'll pick on you know that example. And by the way, there are lots of examples. You know, even going back to some of the early uh, demonstrations of using sort of attacks on PLCs to cause damage to generators and things like yep, that, yep. where that cyber digital can do real damage in the physical world. Um, and a lot of those work in in a very sort of clean lab space environment with a lot of the mitigating controls that you would normally have in an enterprise not in place. I'm not saying that they can't happen, but when you look at sort of the the um, the barrier to entry and where, where attackers are going to go, I, they often goes at the weakest link. And sometimes those more interesting types of attacks, while very possible, the the likelihood with everything else that they could use mm. is lower. Um, and there are, because then there are other mitigating controls. If you know, if you're not verifying your firmware in the first place, or you're not doing proper controls on what gets loaded onto the system, or verifying who has that, I mean, there's a lot of things we should be doing to help reduce the overall risk. It doesn't make it zero. And that's why we need to do more diligence and have better tooling to be able to catch some of these attacks and understand things like BMC hacks and the like. But it does it also, you know, the, the reality is, is that we should also be doing good security and hygiene for those systems to help eliminate or at least reduce the propensity yeah. for those kind of things to happen.
Um, and so, I, I mean, there's a lot, there's some really cool research on, on using, you know, firmware to be able to do things with the, uh, you know, to be able to create the, uh, the, was it, the acoustic uh, jumping of air gaps. There's also some really cool attacks that work well on the lab. When you get into the real world and the complexity of a data center that's got 40 different platforms of various different vendors across yeah. different versions, you know, to scale an attack, sometimes it's just, you know, they can't even scale the mitigation much less the attack. Uh, Steve, you had in the in the show notes for this episode um, what I believe is the enduring security framework, and you had some materials on that. What what is that, and kind of set up for our audience that wants to read more? That's a good question. So ESF or enduring security framework is a uh, uh, it's an industry government collaboration that was set up a number of years ago. Um, with its the focus being to be able to you know to enable that industry government collaboration on the big hairy security topics. Um, things, you know, whether that be uh, things like, you know, 5G security is where some of the, the topics are. Most recently, a lot of publications have come out around supply chain risk management, supply chain security, SBOM. And there's a series of documents that ESF has published. You can find it at, uh, at CISA, you know, DHS CISA, find it from the NSA or at the ESF website. And what they are is guidance for developers, suppliers, and for the customer on how to operationalize and how to implement that got, you know, the mandates, if you will, from the executive order in practical terms. What does it mean to create an SBOM? What does it mean to have supply chain risk management and self-attestation? What are, what are the requirements? What are the, the, the available formats or the standards? And then one of the areas where I think is, you know, is really important is the, is the customer or consumer guidance. What do I do with this document when it shows up? When I buy Windows or I get a platform and it comes with this extra document called SBOM, what do I do with it? How do I get value out of it and how do I operationalize it? both in my acquisitions and in my IT deployment and maintenance side of the camp. So I get the benefit and I don't just get a checkbox. Yeah, I got my SBOM, now I'm gonna go back to my day job. Right. Um, and that's where a lot of the guidance that we're seeing is really helping organizations on the entire life cycle from development all the way through uh, uh, acquisition and deployment of software, understand how to leverage these technologies and how to implement them and how to enable the next phase of the of the supply chain to be able to do what they need to do to then go ultimately get better security at the customer and so esf has published a lot of good documents more on the way uh the, the v2s are just now starting to come out v1 went out last year and then uh, CISA has a, a whole directory of content on sbom on VEX, on tools that you know both that, that are open source and commercial of how to process and do ETL on SBOM or how to uh, leverage VEX and, and SVE. So there's a lot of really good content out there that's being freely given, developed by you know by our you know with taxpayer money to help you by government agencies in collaboration with industry. And that industry represents both the manufacturers, the software developers, and in customers are involved in that process. Outstanding. Steve, thank you so much for appearing on this edition of Eclipsium's Below the Surface. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun and uh, look forward to continuing to engage with you guys. Absolutely. Cheers. With that, that will conclude this edition of Below the Surface. See you next time.